I'm Ryan at the King's Fair here in the Seward neighborhood. Welcome to Inside Minneapolis. Welcome to Inside Minneapolis. I'm Phil Lindsay. And on this edition, we're going to take a look at the east end of Franklin Avenue. A lot of activity has been going on along here. And we're going to be talking with people who can give us kind of the scale of the projects. We'll talk with a gentleman who's been involved since the 1960s. And we'll talk with a woman who's been involved in a project that recently completed here. We'll also send our reporter out to talk with people and find out what it's like to live and work here along Franklin Avenue with all this great activity. But first, let's take a look at an image of some street vendors from 1935. And note the prices on those squash and apples. Pretty good. I'll see you inside. Do you have a favorite restaurant here? Mm, yeah, I do. Well, and welcome back. And for this part of the show, I'm excited to have a gentleman who can give us kind of the big picture about all the developments that have been going on here along Franklin Avenue. David Fay, nice to have you here, sir. It's good to be here. And you are the executive director of Seward Redesign. That's right. And let's just set the table a little bit. Seward Redesign is what and what is your charge? Seward Redesign started in 1969 as a nonprofit developer of housing in the neighborhood. In response to urban renewal plans, the neighborhood got organized and started actually several organizations, one of which was Redesign. And then in, after about 15 years of work, we broadened our scope to look at commercial redevelopment as well and working with small businesses. So now we do all three things. We're still involved in housing in the neighborhood. We work to revitalize the Main Street and other commercial areas of the neighborhood. And we work to keep small businesses growing and employing people in the city. Specifically in that latter category with economic development, it sounds like. Yes, yeah. right. So I, I know right. you have some uh, streetscape work and uh, paint and fix up kind of things mm -hmm. as well. That's right. But you're also talking about the economics inside right. the businesses. We as actually well. coach businesses on marketing, business oh. planning, help them get loans. We operate a a loan program with other community organizations. Okay, so some financial and technical assistance yep. and things like that. Yep. Well now one of the um, exciting things that I've learned about the efforts here on Franklin Avenue mm -hmm. is not only the scale, and I want you to help kind of walk us through some of the scale, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the timeline. This, this goes yeah. back more than a few years. That's right. That's when did right. all this start in its sort of earliest uh, beginnings? Well, it would, it would have been in the early 80s, I think, when the neighborhood first began to have some concern about what they were seeing happening on Franklin Avenue. Some of the businesses were failing. We were beginning to see for the first time in Seward some, some boarded up storefronts, or at least storefronts that were looking like they were heading that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was at the time that, that this organization with its neighborhood board of directors decided, you know, housing is not the whole story. If we want to keep this neighborhood thriving, we really need to look at Franklin Avenue. And um, the first step in that process was a task force that was put together in 1985-86. It was called the Franklin Avenue Task Force. Now we would call it a corridor study, but there, there, weren't even a, there wasn't even a word for that. You were that. ahead of the time. Then, yeah, right, yeah. right. Um, and in looking back through some materials, we, we actually found this... Um, this artifact yes. from, from the late 70s, the point at which the organization was still primarily focused on some scattered site housing activity, but they'd drawn this big red bar here saying Franklin Avenue commercial redevelopment study as a long-range project. The, the organization hadn't begun it yet, but they had identified it as a priority. Yeah, they were that prescient. They knew that down the road that That's really... That's right. Now, am I making an assumption, but it, it's correct. Franklin Avenue is really considered the main street yeah. of this community. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. It's our, it's a, and historically, Historically, it was. You know, it was where the, the drugstore and the barbershop and everything right. that served the community. Well, and as a former worked. resident here, I remember paying my utility bills at a drugstore on the corner. I forget right. exactly where. Ross 20, Drug, 27th yeah, and Franklin. 27th, that's, that's right. That's right. Great. Well, now behind this board, which is very interesting, and I hope our viewers got a chance to just take a peek at this. And by the way, doesn't it look like kind of a 70s document? It does. You the could, super graphics, the colors. That's yes, right. right. And it probably key lined in those days, I would guess. Well, well, this was that stuff you had to cut out and rub on. Oh, you know, I see. That's was, what you're talking about. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some intern was suffering back then. So this is, the, this is the before picture when they just thought, let's look at Franklin, but we don't know what we'll do. Mm -hmm. And then just this last year, 
as part of Redesign's annual report, we produced this map, which is a photograph, an aerial photograph of Franklin. Mm -hmm. And each of these yellow outlines indicates a redevelopment project that's either been completed or is still in progress as a result of that planning work that happened in the mid-80s. And I must say nearly completed, because this, on this map Very much here, it so. doesn't go too far out into the future. No, that's right. That's and right. I'm not sure that our viewers can see the actual detail, but you've identified these different projects with letters, mm -hmm, and you've mm -hmm. darn well got almost the whole alphabet on here. So We're up to W, yes. Yeah. Yep. Many, yep. many projects here. Well, without going into every single specific project, mm -hmm, David, could you mm -hmm. just outline some of maybe the significant and maybe the historical benchmarks? Sure. On, on this? Sure. Well, I think the neighborhood was very savvy when it looked at the whole stretch of Franklin Avenue initially to realize that this is a mixed-use street. It's going to stay that way. It's got high-density apartments, single-family homes, commercial businesses that are retail and community-oriented, but also industrial businesses. Wendell's Rubber Stamp Company, the oh, Dual yes. Machine Tool Company. Yeah. And that, that it, that's not going to change. We're not going to snap our fingers and have Grand Avenue here overnight. Right. So what they did was they looked at nodes, kind of natural centers. Um, the 27th and Franklin node, you mentioned where the Ross Drug store used to be, was identified as kind of the natural neighborhood retail node. But they also identified the intersection of Milwaukee Avenue with Franklin, where there's this historic district and a few little shops that serve the neighborhood as a kind of secondary node that needs attention. And then there was a lot of concern about what we sort of provincially called the West End, the West End in Seward, but right. basically meaning the, the end nearest Cedar Avenue. Right, which is sort of the gateway into your from community the west. from the that's west. That's right, that's yeah. right. And the concern there was that that was kind of a wasteland. It was a lot of big open concrete parking lots, mm -hmm. not, not an area where people felt safe or where there was much positive activity happening. Right, and big wide, I think it's a five corner area with that's streets right. coming in in every that's direction right. and a huge expanse. And at the same time though, thousands of folks go through there and, and there's the opportunity at least to be introduced to That's right. Seward and That's Franklin right. Avenue. That's right. So the planning work then focused on those three nodes and we did it step by step. We didn't try to do everything at once. We looked first at 27th and Franklin and the major the achievement there, kind of the, the, the first big step, the first big change, was that Redesign, working with the neighborhood, actually acquired the building that, has Ross, that had Ross Drug in it and a few other small businesses and redeveloped that building, bringing in a University of Minnesota Family Practice Clinic as an anchor tenant. Yes. And that was kind of the first sign of renewal. Smiley's Point? Smiley's Clinic, that's right. right is, is the there. old Smiley's Point, Smiley's right. Clinic. The same, same function right. moved into that location. Right. So that got us started. Then we did some work on the businesses around the Milwaukee Avenue area and we're continuing with that work today even. We still have a, a current projects in, in the pipeline. And then, um, as, as I'm sure you'll see out on the street, the West End has been really dramatically transformed. Where there once was this wasteland of concrete, there's now a brand new Seward co-op, all nicely landscaped and oriented toward the street. We worked with the Holiday Store when they built a new store to actually move their business down the block a little bit and develop and shared parking. And reorient, reorient to, to create a street edge better. That's right, yeah. and coordinate landscaping around all of that. Um, the old Montanitas is now the Blue Nile restaurant, and that also, we worked out a land exchange there so that the old Crown Video site that was on the corner could be redeveloped for parking to serve them. And we actually moved Crown Video all the way down to the 27th and Franklin corner where we wanted to revitalize an old stop and go grocery there. And had a viable business that you were able to keep That's right. on the street, That's but right. uh, just do a swap, as That's it right. were, bring them over there. We talk about it as a jigsaw puzzle sometimes, yeah. because yeah. the more we've gotten to know and work with the businesses up and down the avenue, the more we've been able to kind of broker exchanges where it doesn't make sense quite the way it works, but if you move a couple things around, right. it does work. Now, on some of those exchanges and those swaps and things, I know if we ran the tape backwards, we'd say, well, it all worked out, or it has mm -hmm. so far. Is it difficult to talk, and I know we're going to have Gail Graham on from the yeah, co-op later in the show, good. and I know that you had a, like a tripartite conversation right. there between right. the, the restaurant, a church, and the, and that was just one example, as, yes. as you're listing here. Yeah. Is it difficult to get some of these business owners to think, well, yeah, we could swap some land, or do they get protective? Yeah. yeah. We th I, think, I think our most important role, really, is to first of all help the community come to a, a strong vision about what it wants on the avenue, but then to bring the parties to the table and to hear people out, have them explain to us what are their individual interests as a business owner, as a resident nearby, but then to bring people back to the community vision and say, okay, we've heard your individual objectives, but in order for us to achieve the larger objective, we need to kind of 
work with it here. And it, the example on the West End was we wanted to reduce all of that concrete. We wanted as little paved neighborhood as possible right. still to provide adequate parking for the related businesses. And what we found was that the church, the co-op, and the restaurant had very different peak periods in terms yeah. of when they have the most people showing up. Mm -hmm. So we were able to do a small, nicely landscaped parking lot that serves all three of those mm -hmm. instead of having each of them have to have this huge yeah, the piece sea. of concrete. Yeah, That's right. Uh, and Lynn Anderson's going to be on a little bit later, and I believe one of the things that they were working on in the 60s were all these parking mm -hmm, issues. Mm -hmm, so that, that right. goes with the territory. Park, I mean, it seems like such a mundane issue, but parking, you end up spending a lot of time talking about yeah. parking, particularly on these aging commercial corridors, because the old standard, um, when these built businesses were all built, was much lower. Now the mm -hmm. city requires much more parking. Yeah, so there's if you all try those to, issues. Right, yeah. you try to bring in a new restaurant now, and suddenly you've got to find 30 new parking spaces. Right. Well, I'm guessing, too, generations ago, a lot of the customers tended to walk to that's these right. neighborhood businesses. That's right. And now, let's face it, even <coughs> folks that live as close as maybe six or seven blocks, they're driving down. But interestingly enough, even when we talked with the Holiday Store, which you think of as an automobile-related business, yeah, very mobile. they understood that half of their clientele is walk-in business is for true? the convenience retail. And so they were very agreeable to yeah. orienting the building in a way that works for pedestrians. That's an impressive uh, fact to know. Same thing for Seward Co-op. They yeah. realized that much of their business is on foot and coming by bike. And so we wanted to bring them, that was another land swap where Gail can talk about that. Right. They originally were looking at the corner way out on the end. Yeah. And we all thought it really made more sense to bring them closer in to where their pedestrian population was walking from. And in a general sense, your role in that of Seward Redesign is to sort of broker not That's only right. the financing, which is a, a, yep. a serious issue, yep. but, but sort of these values and yep. some of these uh, ideas for how to make right. the jigsaw puzzle fit right. back together better. Right. I wanted to ask you one question. Uh, you've been involved, I, I know you were on the board of Seward Redesign, and, yeah. and you've been executive director how long? About four and a half years. About four, well, that's long enough to have bled a little bit. Yeah. Uh, what's the biggest surprise in all of this effort, all this stuff that's been going on? The biggest surprise? Yeah. Boy. You know, I have to say, the reason I'm in this work is that the biggest surprise is that it really can work. That you can, you can, you can come up with a community vision that seems like a pretty major change, mm -hmm. like this West End vision. But actually, when you get the people around the table, you can. If you have a powerful, positive vision there, you can get people to, to give, you know, to bend and to see that there's a common purpose. And to me, that's really inspiring. Yeah. Not only when you see the end result, which is a, a, a really enhanced and revitalized community, but just the experience of that. In a, in a meeting, when, when the light goes on in people's eyes and they say, yeah, well, that would work for us. We can see that. That that's an exciting outcome, you know, and you can walk away from a meeting like that really feeling like something pretty good has charged happened. up by yeah. that. Yeah. Do other communities um, come and talk with you about your experiences and say, "How did you make that work? We're doing something else over here." Yeah, now. and actually, kind of the new horizon for for our organization is beginning to partner with adjacent neighborhoods. Oh, okay. We're working with the Longfellow community to the south. Mm -hmm. We have worked with Prospect Park across the river, and now we're very uh, involved with Phillips on planning for the light rail transit. I was just going to bring that up because yeah. you mentioned Longfellow. Longfellow, Phillips, I mean, you folks are parts of the edges of this long that's right. um, transit corridor that's yeah. happening. There. We've got just a moment left, but yeah. I wanted to ask you what your vision is for both sewer redesign and, and also the impact on the community vis-a-vis -vis this uh, light rail transit the corridor. The corridor. Well, we really see the corridor as the opportunity to literally bridge the tracks. You know, we've had this very severe boundary between Seward and Phillips for years. And people even talk about it as a kind of no one's land, you know, that you don't feel comfortable in that, in that middle ground there. So our objective, and we've set up a six-month planning process with Phillips, equal participation from that neighborhood, is to come up with a community vision for redevelopment around the LRT station that will bridge the communities, bring them together, and reclaim that kind of lost ground mm -hmm. between the two neighborhoods. And we think that the, the potential is enormous there. It's a stone's throw from downtown. It's the second LRT stop from downtown Minneapolis. Yeah. So we think the potential there for housing, for some office development, for some mixed-use commercial in the, mm -hmm. in the mix, in Relevant that immediate area, is, is enormous. That's and that's, that's the objective we're working towards. David, thank you very much for a good overview. Appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Well, in a moment, we're going to get kind of a long view of some Franklin Avenue activities here with businessman Len Anderson. But first, our monthly feature that we call Did You Know? Another word, Gatlin Bridge. Okay, that goes back historically. 
Well, welcome back. And uh, always nice to find out interesting facts about the community that we're taping the show in. Uh, the Kaplan Bridge, named after a uh, city engineer who did a whole lot in the cities in the early part of this century. And by the way, it's at this point in the show we like to remind folks that our other monthly feature, What the Heck, will happen later in the program. But take a quick peek here at the uh, image that we go out in the community and we ask people, what the heck is this? And of course, at the end of the show, we do give the correct answer as to what the heck this is. With me now is Len Anderson. Len Anderson is a uh, businessman and, by the way, a gardener who's responsible for some good-looking property along Franklin Avenue. Len, nice to have you here. Pleasure to be here, Phil. Great. And the property I'm talking about is your Amico station. That's true. Down at the uh, corner of uh, Franklin and Riverside. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what I'm referring to about the gardening, because I just found this out as we were sitting down here, is uh, although I've been noticing nice landscaping there mm -hmm. over the years, you're actually the gentleman, you're the guy getting dirt under the fingernails there. Yeah, we, uh, <clears throat> we bought that property from Amico several years ago and did some improvements. Change the tanks and the pumps and all that type of stuff. Oh, you went up down underneath then? You, you pulled out the old tanks and stuff? Oh, yeah. We had to do that for EPA rules in uh, 1998. And so we laid out that, uh, that point. We'd, we had fooled around with different types of landscaping through the years, and then we, we, uh, we were fortunate to find a landscape architect that helped us with that, and, uh, and we're, we're quite pleased with the results. Well, it's it really a quite, lot of color. It, a lot of color. It's really dramatic, especially as you come from the east, as I come mm -hmm. over that Franklin Avenue bridge. Um, and I know you've characterized it this way, but it really is kind of a, a, a gateway into the community especially coming from the east there. Yes, we think it's, uh, it, it enhances the uh, Seward. Yeah, and, and it does. And it's something that we can give back to the community. Yeah, and I shouldn't just mention that it's coming from the east. Um, Riverside, of course, is the great link into Seward from the West Bank, mm -hmm. you know, by Augsburg mm -hmm. and, and that community That's true. as well. How, when did you start your business over there? I, uh, I became a Standard Oil dealer in March of uh, 1961. 61? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what gas was going for back then? Twenty nine nine. Twenty nine nine. Yeah. And I bet in those days you'd come out and wipe the windows and actually fill it up for oh, people. Oh sure. Yeah. Oh sure. We still do a little bit of that, but yeah. uh, not like we did back in the sixties and the seventies. Lynn, um, the sixties aren't all that long ago, but given all the redevelopment and the efforts that you and mm -hmm. other folks have, have put a hand to in say the last 10, 12 years or so, I wanted to ask you what your memories, what your impression of Franklin Avenue is now, but back then in that time, in the 60s, maybe even in the 70s. What was it like? How did it feel? Well, we could, I go back even farther. I was born and raised in this area, so I went to school in the area, and so my roots are pretty deep here. Um, of course, in those days, uh, most of the transportation was streetcar and eventually buses in the 50, 50s, but there were still some streetcars around. Mm -hmm. And of course, all the intersections had commercial nodes where there'd be a druggist and there'd be a grocery store. And, and uh, but now, of course, everybody's got two or three cars. In most cases, I think it's about two and a half cars per household is the, uh, is the average. And I just, I just so realized that an, an oil and gas man would know that. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're sensitive to traffic and, yeah. and things like that. Anyhow, there were a number, again, there's a bakery and about every, Ten blocks, and, and you know there'd be druggists and uh, small grocery stores, fam mostly family-run businesses. And pretty much along the avenue from what? Well, uh, heavily on the, uh, wherever the streetcars and eventually the buses. Twenty Seventh, Minnehaha, Cedar Riverside, on mm -hmm. and on and on like that is where the nodes were. Twenty Fifth Street, Twenty Seventh Avenue had. Uh, had a number of small businesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't recall, and we have researched in earlier programs, the streetcars in Minneapolis. What was the route? Obviously down Franklin, did it turn at 27th and head that way, or did it go no, that one, over to uh, the river? Or? Well, the Franklin always has been, goes across the river and, okay. and uh, turns, turns up there now, and then it goes uh, Franklin to 11th, and then it goes down 7th Street. That okay. type stuff. Takes you downtown, and then we have the uh, Fort Snelling type stuff that comes down Riverside, out 27th yeah, Avenue. Yeah, it's uh, that direction. 34th, 25th Street, all sorts of yeah. stuff to the greater South Minneapolis. I remember the old number two bus line coming down Franklin. I just mm -hmm. take that over to the university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was in the 60s that you took some leadership, probably with some other folks, and created what I think is still known as the Seward Civic and Commerce Association? Uh, yes, we used that, that name. Um, in the mid-60s, some controversial stuff. Uh, urban renewal um, 
came to the fore, and of course, uh, lots of folks didn't want to fool around with government, didn't, didn't want intervention. But uh, our business group, and we had druggists and painters and restaurants and real estate folks, um, some of us felt that uh, participating and at least having a voice in what was going to happen here, it's, it seemed pretty, uh, pretty cut and dry. There were some folks that thought perhaps it could be stopped or it wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. But it was positive and it was moving forward. So we kind of banded together in a small group and uh, had monthly meetings and invited um, politicians and uh, representatives and then uh, MCDA, I'm not sure if that's what it was called at that time, but... Uh, I think in those days it was the MHRA, Housing and Redevelopment. Housing and Redevelopment. In fact, they that's had an right. office in Seward, as I recall. That's true. At least in the 70s, I remember, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, uh, I fondly remember uh, Bob Dronin, was, uh, who recently retired from MCDA, was uh, our liaison. And uh, so we learned to deal with uh, very city, city agencies mm -hmm. and uh, try to have some impact on... Uh, what was going to happen, and, and uh, I firmly believe that that uh, kept the neighborhood, residents and businesses from deteriorating. It was necessary, mm -hmm. and encourage people to continue to live here rather than to turn it into a rental community. Uh, at, so at that time, and not only was the city, I'm guessing probably the feds were involved. It was that big urban renewal thing out of HUD or whatever mm -hmm. in those days. Certainly, yeah, there was there was federal stuff, but I. I, it's been a while, but my recollection is that uh, it was delegated down and, you know, we, we were able to work to that the, the that local agency. level. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if, if all that was sort of marching towards Seward and then you folks kind of came from the community to engage that, was that really the beginning of the process that's led right up now uh, that would, you know, in, in the latest uh, days called NRP, that sort of thing? I mean, is this where that began? Oh, very similar. Yeah, yeah very kind of similar. Thing. What were the issues in those days? What was, it? was it mostly housing? Well, it was, uh, yeah, basically the community was full of uh, single and two families. I can't recall many apartments. If they were, they were, there were some on 25th Street, I suppose, four packs or eight packs. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, things were changing and uh, the university was growing up Riverside. That's right, they were coming over to the West Bank. Yeah, West Bank stuff was going on. Yeah. Uh, the hospitals had some, uh, Fairview and St. Mary's had some interest in. Uh, in acquiring more property and growing too and creating more jobs. So they're coming this way. They certainly were. I mean, it was yeah. going to happen. And uh, so uh, lots of, it, I mean, uh, so our civic group were our business folks. And, and I suppose you're talking about uh, from the freeway down to the railroad tracks in 27th and from the river over to Cedar. Um, some commercial, um, some service industries. Um, uh, a lot of light manufacturing stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there were some areas that were pretty depressed and some of that was cleared and brought some more jobs into the area. And some of those businesses have turned and grown and continued to stay here and others have moved out. But uh, basically all of that, uh, all those buildings uh, have been heavily used and paid off the bonds and did all yeah. that good stuff. Yeah, a lot of reuse in this mm -hmm. community. And brought some good jobs to the general area too. We were yeah. we were coming off the uh, Minneapolis Moline stuff mm -hmm. and uh, in, in the big railroad yard. So well, it was the transition. Yeah, the railroads were a big part of, of Seward as a community. We're still here, yeah. And Milwaukee Avenue, of course. Uh, I'm assuming maybe I shouldn't, but was named after the Milwaukee Road. Mm, I don't know that. Not necessarily, huh? Maybe that's just been an that. assumption. Well, it could be. Yeah. Could very well be. Because I know the impact of the, the railroad. We'll have to do some uh, reading to see if <laughs> that makes sense to me. Are there some historians here in the community, folks like yourself, that have paid attention and kept the, the message going over the years? Oh, there's a wonderful group, um, just the uh, Seward Neighborhood Group, and uh, uh, the Dick Westbys, um, mm -hmm. the uh, High Berman. Mm -hmm. uh, these folks uh, forgot more about this neighborhood than I'll ever know. And, and uh, incidentally, there's a uh, there's a Seward Fair here coming up. Uh, I believe it's this weekend. It's an every other year event. It's a biannual event mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. commemorates something that I didn't know until we did a little research. But there was this, and I forget his first name, but a King's Fair. That's what it's called. Uh, my understanding is that there were, uh, my, my parents told me this, 
that uh, there were uh, uh, fairs in this area, also down on Lake Street, and we're going back to the turn of the century. I well, guess. a little later in this show, we're going to show a montage of some images that our researcher, Sherry Nolan, pulled out from the Historical Society of the Minneapolis mm -hmm. Public Library uh, of some, some of the fairgrounds that were here, actually along Franklin Avenue, mm -hmm. um, heading towards the river between 24th Avenue and the river. My and then, of course, there was Wonderland. I don't know if that's what you're referring to, down on Lake Street, which yes. is a huge amusement park. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's the one I've been thinking about. Yeah. yeah. So a great area to have some entertainment. Mm -hmm. sort of thing. I wanted to go back to some of the issues, um, maybe from the earlier days, but also I think they continue to this day. Was parking always kind of an issue around here? Well, I don't believe in the 60s it was anything like it is today, but uh, yeah. as, as, you know, we, we could talk about the uh, freeway system and uh, President Eisenhower and all that type mm -hmm. of stuff that created the incredible growth, positive or negative, depends yeah. on your point of view, but certainly it's expanded this community and this still is a place where uh, you can live 40 miles away and still get to work in a reasonable time, you know, yeah. Long Lake to uh, to Hudson and Elk River to Lakeville or whatever. And still make it in. Yeah, you're yeah. right. We're kind of blessed with that mm -hmm. in this community. And, I, and I've always thought that the, the fact that the uh, interstate was put below grade was, it was a nice effect rather than having it as in most cities right at street level. Keeps the sound down a little bit and allowed um, bridge decking over it to keep well, some semblance of the community. Yeah, I feel pretty controversial. Of course, an uh, awful lot of homes were moved. Where or, they went, yeah. Or yeah. dislocated. And uh, yeah. I was here when they dug that trench. Yeah. For 94. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in all the years that you've been involved with your leadership role with the Commerce Association and as an active uh, resident and, mm -hmm. and person who grew up here, um, if other folks are watching our show and they're thinking about getting involved in their community, wherever it is, so let's say outside of Seward, any advice to somebody? Because uh, there's got to be some struggle involved here. You've got to do a little arm twisting. You've got some mountains to climb. Any advice you'd give somebody to... Think about getting involved no, no, no. with their community. I, I don't know. I, I don't think they're necessarily, well, some neighborhoods do have some controversy going on on occasion and some differences of opinion. And I, I went to some of those meetings in the 60s that were uh, pretty spirited. Cedar Riverside had some exciting times. Northeast mm -hmm. Minneapolis had some exciting times. So mm -hmm. we, we kind of learned from going to all those meetings. And, um, and you know, it, it, it gave us an opportunity to get closer to the elected officials. Mm -hmm. and uh, in some of the various departments, street departments, whatever, mm -hmm. traffic departments. Build those relationships. Well, and, and have some input, uh, I think, is... Uh, I, I feel that it was helpful and uh, gratifying to be able to contribute. Didn't always get your way, collectively or individually, but... But enough of the time to make it worth your while. And in it, uh, I, I believe it saved the residential community from going really downhill, and I think it brought a lot of jobs into this area. All right. Lynn Anderson, thank you very much. My pleasure, Nice Phil. to get your perspective. Well, and in just a moment, we're going to be talking with Gail Graham from the Seward Co-op. They have a new building, although they've been in the uh, neighborhood for about a generation. You're watching Inside Minneapolis. We're here at the Playwright Center, and let's hear from our host, Carlo Cuesta. Hi, I'm Carlo Cuesta. I'm the executive director of the Playwright Center. We've been around here in the heart of the Seward neighborhood on Franklin Avenue for over 27 years now. Uh, we work to support playwrights by providing them with services that help them connect with audiences around the country. Well, thanks, Carl. It's always nice to uh, have somebody from our host spot tell us what goes on here. And the Playwright Center is a venerable institution, not only here in Franklin Avenue, but of course it's meant a lot to the Twin Cities cultural community. So thanks for having us in here. My next guest is the manager, I believe, at the Seward Co-op, Gail Graham. Nice to have you here. Thank you, Phil. And um, I want to establish for our viewers a little bit of background about the Co-op. Um, I know it's been here for a, a while, at least in this community, and you have some new digs, but could you give us a little bit of history? Sure. The co-op has been in Seward since 1972 when we started. Over the years, we um, started out in a small location where the Wellna Hardware Store is now, and in 84, we were able to remodel that building pretty substantially. A few years later, we were able to build an expansion onto it, but it was still a very small store. A number of years ago, we started to look at better ways to serve our members and our owners. We're a natural foods cooperative, so we sell a wide variety of fresh produce, natural food line products, supplements, vitamins, 
Um, in our new store, we have a full deli with a salad bar and a juice bar. That's a nice addition, by the way. It's, it's really been nice very popular, very, yeah. very popular, and certainly with the staff as well as the people in the neighborhood. Oh, so a certain amount of sales uh, registered from that, huh? Yes, lunches, hot lunches. I, you know, I used to volunteer both at Seward and at North Country, and I remember we always had to put signs up saying, pay for your snacks, because we weren't always as volunteer. We weren't always real good <laughs> about that, but that was, I think we're beyond... Uh, getting in trouble for that. Yeah, well, we all try and pay for our food, for That's sure, right. before we eat it or you forget. That's right. Um, we also have a wide variety of cheeses, both imported and domestic and organic, and cheese alternatives. And in our new store, we have meat, fresh meat case available as well. And that wasn't true in, before you moved over? That wasn't true. We had frozen meat. Oh, okay. Um, we don't have right. a full butcher, but we have, there's an increasing supply available to us of meats that are raised under certified organic conditions or that are farm raised under cleaner conditions than commercial foods are. So again, a good step up from sort of the, if you will, the conventional uh, fare that people might buy That's otherwise. correct. In our old store, we had about 1,400 square feet of retail space, which is very, very tiny. Was that in the original configuration? No, that was in the larger configuration. So that was even after some space was added? That's right. Yeah. And when we finished up there, we were doing about 1.4 million in sales out of that location. And it was the way too crowded, way too crowded for us. And I, and I, and I validate that comment, but think of what that, those sales per square foot must have been, though. I can't even remember, but yeah. they were high. I think you had your checkout stacked or something. <laughs> how, how could you possibly? That's impressive. It, it was a good, good figure for us. Yeah. And it, it spoke to the fact that we needed more space. Mm -hmm. We were challenged because, like any co-op, we're tied to our community. We're an important part of Seward, and Seward is in, in very important to us because the health of our store really depends on the health of the community. Uh, we were looking for an opportunity to expand on Franklin Avenue. Our board was really committed to finding a space to put a larger store up, but we also were committed to staying on Franklin because it's the main commercial corridor in Seward. Mm -hmm. And we felt that that was where we should be. Just if I may interrupt for a second, uh, given the commitment to Franklin, did you mm -hmm. even bother looking further south or, or off the area, or was that just a given? We, we didn't look seriously off Franklin. There didn't was, ignore any possibilities. We but, didn't ignore any possibilities. There yeah. were a few we, we just toyed with, but we never really took much of a serious look at them. It just didn't seem right. It didn't feel right. So a real commitment to Franklin Avenue. Yes. The main street of the community. And it was probably close to six years ago, I think. I, David would have probably given you the exact date yeah. when the task force on the west end of East Franklin began meeting. And I was part of that task force committee. Uh, at that time, we were just really beginning to explore what we might be able to do. And we felt very challenged by the lack of properties on Franklin. So we, we discovered in, as part of that process that there were some potentials there, that if we could really um, work hard, we might be able to open up some doors. And we started finding out more about the changes that were eminent on Franklin. We looked at the building that Seward redesigned and the, the uh, Clay Center. Our oh, the old windows. Yeah. Right. We looked yeah. at that building as, as one possibility. We looked at the site where Crown Video is presently located, the old Tip Top, I believe it was. Right, which, as you're saying, is their new space their for Their new Crown. space. Yeah. And we looked at the Montanitas property, which at that time was a challenge business that was just being kind of kept open by Liberty State Bank because it was better to have somebody there than nobody there. Well, good point. And if I may interject here, um, our research people found out, uh, just out of curiosity, because once upon a time, what's now the Blue Nile mm -hmm. was Montanitas. Correct. And in doing some research on old plat maps and the like, mm -hmm. um, that had been a grocery store for some 50 years. Um, going back, I think, from the late 19th century, somewhere to around World War II. And then they started selling, I think, bottled liquor or something, and then it started turning into restaurants. Well, that's interesting. I should have had you on board when I was doing yeah. the research. I didn't go back that far. Yeah, but it's always been an area where victuals were available. Mm -hmm. So very interesting, though, that you say that it was identified as a place where maybe some enhancement could be mm -hmm. had. We, we really we talked to Liberty Bank and told them of our interest, but they were committed to not splitting the property up prematurely because they knew that for it to continue to be a viable restaurant serving liquor, it would need a certain amount of parking. And so they were really uh, concerned about any early splits to the property. It was much too large of a piece for us to handle for our project, way more than we needed. So we originally worked with them to purchase the Crown, what was called the Crown Video site. It was the corner um, closest to all of the, where all of the roads intersect, Minnehaha, Minnehaha Hiawatha, they're all yeah. converged there. Yeah. Crown Video's location was on that corner. And, and surrounded by a bunch of just asphalt, basically, Correct. as I recall. Yeah. Correct. 
And then there was Montanitas and a very large um, parking lot that was in a state of decay. Mm -hmm. We bought the Crown, the Crown Video site, and that was a challenging um, now, when you say we, this is... The co-op. Yeah, the co-op actually bought that. So yes. that was part of your role there. We bought that site. And the owner of Crown Video, Chris, had not been able to successfully conclude negotiations with the bank. She had also been interested in it. Once we purchased it, she started to work with the neighborhood to look for a new location. And that's when she ended up down at Tip Top. Um, we never felt that site was perfect, but it seemed like it was the only site we were ever going to get on Franklin Avenue. It posed substantial challenges for us. It was a little bit too small. Mm -hmm. We were concerned about the access to it because it was a very busy intersection. And we were especially concerned about just being another half a block further away from the residential part of Seward. It's really right okay. on the edge of the neighborhood. So uh, what I would conclude from what you're saying is that although you would have used it if that's what you had to use, you really were looking back into the community. As you mentioned, the residential, mm -hmm. you were not particularly looking at this sort of great commuter stream going no, by. No, no. A large part of our trade walks in, mm -hmm. historically. 30% of our shopping, shopping public come by bike or walking. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are frequent shoppers. They're there many, many times during the week. Um, we knew that we wanted to have a, that friendly pedestrian sort of access to our store. And we were very concerned that that site right on the corner of the neighborhood would be kind of an asphalt jungle, that it would be um, more car friendly than people friendly, mm -hmm. and that it would just put us farther away. So sure. we well, had our concerns about it. And necessarily, you need parking. I mean, yes. The other 70% maybe is coming in that yes. way. So, yeah. Our preferred spite site has always been the site that we're presently on. When we did our original market study, which was back in 94, and before we had any property even lined up for sure, we did a study of the site that we ended up building on. Our original hope was that we could talk to Liberty Bank about just breaking off that portion of the land to break off that parking lot portion and sell it to us. When we weren't able to do that, we bought the Crown Video site, partially because we thought that it would still maybe work out for us to do some sort of swap. Um, the same time we were purchasing that site, Fami Katabi was purchasing what's now the Blue Nile, the mm -hmm. Montanita site. And as I recall, he was moving over from uh, Lindale and Lake? That's right. Because there were some changes the going on there with the was, Jungle Theater. Right. And so he needed a new space, and welcome to Seward. Right. Yeah. So he got that location, and we immediately entered into discussions with him about swapping pieces of land. Um, we, our vision was that he could use that site for parking, we could build the on, old the, on the other site, correct. Yeah and that we would be where we wanted to be, and his parking would be more, um, a better use, a better use for that pot, plot of land because of the access to the different roads there. Mm -hmm. And that it would be better for the neighborhood in, in terms of how it would look and how things would flow. It's a challenge to really come together with a number of businesses. We also had to begin discussions with Riverside Assembly of God, with Pastor Jacobs, right? because they own part of that land as well. It's just the strange little parcel that's Fami's land was actually L-shaped, and then the church was in the corner. So the three of us began meeting, working with Seward Redesign, ultimately. We did work a little bit with a private developer, but then switched to working with and, Redesign. And David Faye characterized this as sort of a jigsaw puzzle, yes. working with not one, not two, but in this case, three partners mm -hmm. to figure out sort of mutual parking needs. And, and the, the serendipity was, you have different peak hours. Yes. It worked well. It, from the beginning, it seemed to me that it would work very well because of the difference in hours. And it's always... Um, somewhat ludicrous the amount of parking spots that are required, although when every parking spot is filled up, you might get a little annoyed. Mm -hmm. But it did seem that there was ample parking for the three businesses. That's right. So with the help of redesign, we were able to pull together the three businesses mm -hmm. so that we could come up with a project that would meet our mutual needs and I think resulted in a much better project for the neighborhood as well. That's great. Gail, we have just a minute left. Mm -hmm. With all the changes that have gone on along the avenue, and then in particular with your new facility, mm -hmm. Uh, what has this meant for your business? Well, it's been doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Our sales increased 100% the first year, and we're on track for the increases we're projecting this 100%? year. 100%? Yes. Very impressive. We were very pleased. That's what we, had, that's what we needed to hit. Yeah. Um, it's certainly raised the complexity of our business a great deal. Our staff has gone from about 20 to about 52, depending on that's the day impressive. of the week. Yeah. Um, as I said, we've added a number of services. Our membership has grown from about 800 to about 1,400. And I think we're continuing to bring in people because we are able to provide them with the goods and services that they need. 
So well, we've been very all. pleased. Congratulations. Thank you. Sounds like it was worth all the effort. It was. Okay. Thanks, Gail Graham. Thank you, Phil. Now, we're going to go out on the street with one of our assistant producers, Elizabeth Haugen, to find out what it's like on the avenue for residents and business people with all these changes that are going on here on Franklin Avenue. But first, let's take a look at a nice montage of some images from that King's Fair that we were referring to earlier. Stay tuned. Elizabeth Haugen and we are inside Minneapolis. We're here on Franklin Avenue to speak with some of its residents, business people and artists and find out what draws them here. What do they like about Franklin Avenue? Let's go inside Seward Tower East and talk with Midge and Myrtle. It's very uh, easy to get around and we have this beautiful river, trees, uh, and the river road now, I understand it's completed clear out beyond northeast Minneapolis. And I just found that out, so I took that the other day, and it's gorgeous. And uh, I love the trees. I live on the south side, so I can overlook south Minneapolis. The people on the north side overlook the river. And both of them are, are wonderful and entirely different, really, because they get downtown and I get all the trees over here. It looks like a green velvet carpet when I look out there in, this, in the summertime. And in the wintertime, it's just a fairyland. I enjoy it here. I, enjoy, I love it here. I'd never lived in South Minneapolis before. I'd lived north and northeast. And although I was happy up there, when I came here, it was all new to me, and I didn't know South Minneapolis from beans. So I, uh, well, over the years, I, I, I know uh, South Minneapolis better, and I do my north and my northeast area, but, but I love it here. I used to live over on 11th Avenue, but that was a smaller apartment and everything, and this is nicer, and I've enjoyed it here very much all the 19 years. And um, it seems like the neighborhood has changed since I came because they, they built this, uh, they had this store over here, which has been upgraded in a very, you know, since we've came. And I think Franklin Avenue has really improved too. We've got the, that uh, holiday, you know, they just remodeled that. And also that um, Seward, um, what do they call it? Ethnic Foods, you know, they have, uh, I don't know, um, about 22nd. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I think it's, they've been proven. They, the landscape and everything around here is, it has done a lot with since I came. See, I live on the north side of the building, so I can see the university and the hospitals and the, all the trees. It's so beautiful in the summertime. I don't like to be up too high because I, that's why I don't like to fly, but I, I've flown a lot, but I, I don't like it. I sit very light when I fly. Of course, that's supposed to help, you know. Franklin has changed um, for the better, I think, these last years. So uh, and even the transportation, like going downtown, we have a bus that goes right by here, which is nice for the, those of us that don't drive. Thanks, Midge and Myrtle, for taking the time out of your busy schedules and showing us around Seward Tower East. Now we're going to go inside the co-op and talk to Leo. Ooh, well, Seward Co-op's been at this location since July 24th, 98, so 14, 15 months. But we started out uh, across the street on 22nd in the small store that's now Well in the Hardware. Um, in 1972. So we've been in business for 27, 28 years, um, supplying natural food and groceries to the community. And we started out real small, really small. You know, when I moved here in 77, the Seward area, Seward neighborhood was, uh, was pretty run down. Um, and 
the city, I don't know if the community development, um, I don't know if it was MCDA back in those days, but the city funded some money and rebuilt Milwaukee Avenue and, uh, and uh, started uh, improving the avenue, boy, down, especially the other side of Hiawatha has really changed a lot. Uh, there was um, oh, the, the whole face of Franklin Avenue, the other side of Hiawatha has changed, and it's changing now here, too. Uh, new businesses, buildings are going, are being torn down and rebuilt, and new businesses starting. Um, what I like about Franklin Avenue, well, I don't know, it's still alive. It's got some, uh, some urbanness to it. Uh, this area, the East Franklin area, just across the bridge from uh, the university, or across the highway from the university and Prospect Park across the river, uh, it's really got a lot of vitality. It's close to downtown St. Paul. It's really close to downtown Minneapolis. It's close to Highway 94. It's its own little community. And uh, that whole area is really fed by Franklin Avenue and the businesses along here. It's really maintaining and growing its vitality. Thanks, Leo, for taking the time to talk to us about Seward Community Co-op. Now we're going to go inside Hoffman Guitars and talk to Ron. <laughs> I've been here, I've been with the shop for 20 years, so I've seen uh, big improvements. Seward redesign has helped uh, restore a lot of the buildings along Franklin. Um, when I first started here, I was only part-time, so I didn't see a whole lot of what was going on along Franklin Avenue, but yeah, we have a new shop next door and new buildings, and they're rehabbing everything. Looks real nice. Uh, we had some help um, from Seward redesign to redo the front of the building. So we're more climate controlled, which we need here for guitar repair. The, the things that happen along Franklin that have happened so far that I've seen as renovations of a lot of buildings, um, new businesses coming in, um, strong businesses, uh, and still it's, we're in a residential area. Not even half a block away is um, the old rehabbed um, Milwaukee Railroad row houses, and that's a a great community um, and there's it's so much residential and Augsburg College is right across the highway like I said it's very diverse uh, the buildings that have been rehabbed look great I mean uh, the we have the Cedar um, Cultural Center and the Cedar Fest that's grown every year so much so that I can't get a parking place anymore <laughs> when it happens so it's a it's a growing strong community Thanks, Ron. That's a beautiful workspace over at Hoffman Guitars. Now, as soon as I finish my coffee break, I'm going to go inside Second Moon and talk to Lisa and Cindy. Um, I like the mix that it pretty much, one, I like the two long streets in Minneapolis. One is Lake Street and one is Franklin that cut through everything that the city has in terms of economics, in terms of ethnic mix, in terms of architecture and the, you know, it goes from the lakes to the river and stuff like that. And they're old streets and they're pretty highly trafficked and they're interesting. And this stretch is kind of cool because it has all the little things people need, a hardware store. It has really good restaurants and that are, you know, interesting and and also just really some very casual ones, which is nice. It has a good, you know, food co-op that's been really active. It has some art things like the Northern Clay Center stuff. So with the Playwright Center, um, all that kind of stuff, it's, it's one, good for business, but it's also interesting. Then it's neat to see a little area work hard on developing and being a place of access for the people who live there. And I think they're doing it really wisely here. You know, we were really recruited to come to this area. I hadn't really considered it until um, Seward Redesign had said, we've got a great space for you. We think you should come and look at it. And I looked at the building and fell in love with it and knew that it was a really tight community and the neighbors took a lot of pride in the neighborhood and that's something that's really important to me. I don't want to be some place where people are just kind of ho-hum about whether you're there or not. I want the neighbors to feel like this is part of their, their space, like an extension of their home. 
you know, when I talk to people and when we first started building and looking at space, people would come up to me and say, oh, are you going to put a coffee shop there? I'm like, yeah. They're like, great, we've been waiting and waiting for one. So it was, I mean, every person I talked to said exactly the same thing. You know, it's pretty interesting because when the coffee shop first starts out, starts out really slow. So I've got to spend a lot of time staring out the window and watching people go by and getting to know the people who frequent the area. And um, they've talked about the history of Milwaukee Avenue and the history of Franklin Avenue and how things have changed and how they've grown. And I mean, meeting the people is really the most important part to me about doing coffee shop because it's what you have to do 90% of the time is interact with the public. Well, thank you, Cindy and Lisa, over at Second Moon. And now we're going inside Northern Clay to talk to Emily. Uh, we do anything you want to do with clay. We uh, teach it. We provide facilities for people to make it. Uh, we have resident artists in the back. Um, we exhibit the best from the region and across the country and some internationally now in our exhibition space which is down there and then we also sell it in its finished form in the sales gallery as you see around you. The one thing we don't do is make it from scratch that is the clay itself. We buy that in boxes. It, you know some of the buildings are getting fixed up. Um, Zips Liquor uh, now looks a lot better than it did um, and there's the new co-op so it feels like the avenue is is spiffing up and I and I think that's obviously all to the good and with the playwrights uh, playwright center changes I think that's gonna be terrific too uh, so it'll just draw a lot more people to the area we have good street visibility you can see I mean people can see in which in our old building they couldn't um, we had black glass windows and so you know, you'd see people primping in the windows uh, which isn't what we want to have happen. Um, so we got wonderful visibility. It's a, you know, it's a nice little building. Um, and uh, the neighbor, you know, the park at the end of the street, it's just, it's a nice feeling neighborhood. Many thanks to the residents, business people, and artists of Franklin Avenue who have given us their perspective of the area. I'm Elizabeth Haugen, and we are inside Minneapolis. I don't know, flowers? Well, actually, grass of some kind. It's hard to say. It might be a nice house behind there. It looks like a house with um, a fence that has some hedges that have overgrown. Somebody's backyard in bad shape. It looks like a building with some trees around it. I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. What, a building? Uh, it looks like uh, somebody's house. It looks like an outhouse of some sort. <laughs> a greenhouse of some sort. What do you think it is? Uh, it looks like a bunch of uh, bushes underneath the interstate. Well, I think it's a restaurant that uh, has lots of greenery in front of it. A bridge. Mm. Look like a house. I don't know. <laughs> do you want to give me a clue or a hint? Um, a project house with um, I really don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, actually, it, it looks like there used to be steps there going up to some kind of storefront. I think that's a picture of uh, some uh, office building or something. I have no idea. <laughs> like a Santa Claus display, is that what it is? Otherwise, I would talk about the shrubs and <laughs> something's on top of there. Well, now let's go to Carolyn E. Olson with the correct answer to what the heck is that. Behind me we have the uh, Seward townhouses. This was developed by the Seward Redesign in 1979, pardon me, and there were 12 units. They are located in Minneapolis just off of Highway 94. You can hear the traffic here and uh, Riverside Avenue. It was a uh, really a substandard lot at the time. It was uh, kind of falling down dilapidated housing and the Seward Redesign neighborhood decided to do something with the site. They built these 12 earth sheltered townhomes, they're two and three bedrooms. They have uh, solar panels off of their uh, front yards, which is behind the uh, units, and they have nice little gardens. It was partly funded with a HUD grant for solar 
uh, grants that they had during that time and housing from the Housing Finance Agency and the Greater Minneapolis Metropolitan Housing Corporation provided funding. Also, the Trinity Lutheran Congregation uh, provided a letter of credit and they were very active in the Seward neighborhood and urban development in the city and they're actually located on the West Bank, but they have been very instrumental in this neighborhood as well. The uh, homes have uh, not turned over much. I drive by this neighborhood quite often, and there is not uh, a for sale sign comes up very seldom. So I'm sure it's providing wonderful housing for uh, the families that live there. Back to you, Phil. Well, now, before we wrap up this edition of Inside Minneapolis, I want you to take a look at a very nice image. It's of the old Monroe Public School. It used to be right here at 23rd and Franklin, built in uh, 1875, and was right across the street from the Playwright Center. Now next month on Inside Minneapolis, we're gonna take a look at yet another corridor here in Minneapolis. This one is a natural corridor, the Minnehaha Creek. Should be a nice show. Now at the end of this show, we're gonna have our usual catalog of resources and of course our credits, and we always run alongside those a nice image from the area in which we've just been. Now we do have a hotline if you'd like to call for more information about the people or the topics we've had on this show. That's 673-2234. And we also have a website you can get hold of, www.mcda.org. We'll see you next time on Inside Minneapolis. I'm Phil Lindsay. I think I'm going to go down in the street and get something to eat. <laughs>